right, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down volume one of the comic Irredeemable, written by Mark Wade. This is the beginning of my Irredeemable coverage. I'm planning on covering the entire series. There was also a spin-off series named Incorruptible, which kind of crosses over with Irredeemable a bit, although I don't know if I'm going to go through the entirety of that one too, although we shall see. So it was just announced a few weeks ago that Irredeemable slash Incorruptible is being made into a movie on Netflix. So that is really exciting, although it will probably not be done for a few years. Now, Irredeemable is a book that many people on my YouTube channel here have asked me to cover, especially since my coverage of The Boys, because in The Boys, there is a character named the Homelander, and he is kind of an evil Superman type of character, although he is sort of reining himself in for most of the series. Well, Irredeemable is about a character named the Plutonian, who is also a Superman type character, and he goes evil basically right away. So in the beginning of issue one, he's already going crazy and killing people and doing all sorts of evil things, and it is immense fun to watch it go down. And you are just left wondering, how are these people in this book going to stop the Plutonian? And also, what set the Plutonian off? What made him turn bad? These are the mysteries that will be unraveled in this book. And it is an immensely fun time, so let's dive into it. Irredeemable, Volume 1. Irredeemable, Volume 1, written by Mark Wade and art by Peter Krauss. Character Breakdown Before I dive into Issue 1, I want to introduce you all to some of our main characters. So, our main character is named the Plutonian. Plutonian has an alter ego by the name of Dan Hardigan. A lot of the characters refer to Plutonian as Tony, which is sort of a short form for Plutonian. Plutonian? Tony? Get it? Plutonian, or Tony, is a Superman-type hero in the world of Irredeemable. He basically has all the stereotypical powers you would associate with Superman. He can heat or freeze the air, see through objects, fly, is basically indestructible, possesses super strength and heightened senses, etc. Plutonian starts out as the typical Superman Boy Scout type, but deep inside, below the surface, there is a real darkness there. And eventually, he goes full-on villain. A lot of the fun of this series is slowly getting the backstory filled in on what it is exactly Plutonian's history is, and what pushed him over the edge, and how will he be stopped. Plutonian is part of a hero group called the Paradigm, there are many members in the Paradigm, even beyond the 10 I have on this page here, but these are the core 10 we will be focusing on in the story. The kind of leader of the Paradigm now is Cubit. He is the smartest man alive. He possesses a genius intellect and is capable of mentally rearranging components of machinery to form whatever device he imagines including teleportation technology. There is Gilgamos, a 2,000-year-old winged warrior. He is married to Bet Noir. Bet Noir is a female crime fighter with uncanny aim and customized bullets she uses to fight crime with. Her bullets are capable of blowing buildings apart, and she is married to Gilgamos, but she also in the past had an affair with the Plutonian. Kaden, she has the ability to summon characters from Japanese legends to fight alongside her. Volt is a black superhero with electrical powers. There is Charybdis, or Kerry. He is a twin and partner of Scylla. Kerry possesses energy manipulation and projection powers, among others. Him and his twin brother Scylla share their powers. Supposedly, if they are not together, they are powerless. Samsara is the Plutonian's former sidekick and his best friend. He is empowered by a mystical crystal embedded in his forehead 
that enables him to create simple temporary constructs of mystical energy. They protect him from mortal harm, making him virtually immortal. And there is Hornet, a former policeman who relies on skill and gadgets to fight crime. He has a wife and two kids. Alright, now that we know who the Paradigm is and its members, let's go over to Issue 1. In Issue 1, this comic wastes no time getting to the action. When the issue opens up, we see Plutonian at the house of Paradigm member The Hornet. Tony is watching the Hornet's daughter Sarah sleeping through her bedroom window. The Hornet runs into the bedroom and grabs his daughter and tells her they can't stay here. The Hornet yells for his wife Donna to grab the baby and get ready for them all to go. The Hornet tells his wife he knows everything about all of us, our identities, where we live, who our families are, everything. We have to leave now. Plutonian then with his heat vision blasts open the window and flies into the home. Hornet and his family are running through the house. Plutonian with his heat vision incinerates the Hornet's wife and baby. The Hornet with his daughter Sarah continues running, but Plutonian eventually catches up to them. The Hornet tells Plutonian, please, not my daughter too, she's only a little girl. Plutonian replies, I know exactly what she is. She's a carbon bag of atoms and bioelectricity. Plutonian then uses his heat vision and incinerates the Hornet, turning him into bones. He then walks up to Sarah and tells her, Do you know who I am, Sarah? I'm a superhero. He then murders her off panel and flies away. Wow, what an opening! Right off the bat, he has already turned bad. As the book progresses, we will see glimpses or flashbacks to happier times when the Plutonian was a hero of the people, and we will look for clues of what set him over the edge. We see one such flashback right now, when Plutonian saved the day at a baseball stadium. He stopped a robot that had a radioactive bomb inside of him. Plutonian, after stopping the bomb from going off, waved to the crowd in the baseball stadium, and the crowd cheered, and Plutonian basked in his glory. A normal person would assume that the whole crowd loved him. He just saved their lives, and they were all cheering for him, but Plutonian, with his great hearing, could hear absolutely everyone in the stadium. 99% of people did love him and had positive things to say, but there was those 1% of assholes that would mutter things under their breath like, show off jerk, flip an underwear pervert. Plutonian would suppress his anger at those people that day, but he would bottle it up inside and those little things would slowly add up over time. Back to the current day. It is one week after the death of the Hornet. The remaining members of the Paradigm are working together and trying to figure out how to stop Plutonian and the rampage he is going on. The Paradigm members are talking to Samsara. Samsara was Plutonian's sidekick and best friend. Cubit is trying to get Samsara to help give them information on how they could potentially stop Plutonian as Samsara knows Plutonian more than any of them, but Samsara says he can't remember. He's trying, but he can't hardly remember anything anymore. Cubit and the others wonder why Samsara doesn't seem to remember much, but then they see a scar on the back of his head, and it becomes clear that Plutonian performed a lobotomy on Samsara with his eye beams. Due to Samsara's regenerative abilities, Plutonian could never kill him, but he could destroy Samsara's brain enough so that Samsara's powers could keep him alive, but the damaged brain tissue would never heal, leaving him permanently brain damaged. Now, even though he is still sort of alive, he is kind of effectively dead, and thus he is buried. Samsara asks if he can please lie down again now, and Cubit answers, Yes, Sam, you can. And Samsara returns to his grave. The remaining members of the Paradigm discuss what they can do about Plutonian. Gilgamos says, That's what the world's greatest superhero did to his partner? 
Anyone else think that's the least he'd do to us if he caught us again? Caden asks, well, what do we do? Cubit says, we learn. We know Plutonian's powers, but not his limits. You know his methods, but not his background. Everyone, try and remember anything personal he ever revealed, ever. Your lives depend on it. Bet Noir says, she thinks that Plutonian has a girlfriend, um, Alana something, Alana Patel? Cubit says, this is good. We should go look for her and ask her anything about Plutonian's weaknesses. Cubit then gives orders to the others to find out about Plutonian's secret identity. Does he have parents? Is he from Earth? Cubit gives each team member a device called a Quantum Jumper. He tells them all to use it if Plutonian ever gets on your trail. We have to keep on the move. If we stand in one place like this long enough, we're as good as dead. At that moment, Plutonian flies in the sky above them. The Paradigm begin running, and Cubit tells the group, Everyone scatter! Stay in contact on the hyperfrequencies he can't hear! Go, go, go! And they all use the quantum jumpers and teleport away. Issue 2 We see a flashback to a happier time. To a younger Kaden using her powers to summon characters from Japanese legends to fight criminals in Sky City. Plutonian joined her that day, and they had a team-up, and took the various criminals down. Kaden was young and not very confident in her abilities at the time, but she was reassured by Plutonian that she was doing a good job. At the end of their team-up, Plutonian told her, Back to headquarters for you, I'll take it from here. You relax, I have a city to patrol. It's a beautiful city, isn't it? And Kaden replied, it is. That was then, though, and this is now. We see Kaden has white hair, and Sky City has been completely obliterated. Two weeks ago, when Plutonian first started acting out, his first act of madness was to destroy most of the city. Millions died. Kaden goes to visit Plutonian's ex-girlfriend, Alana Patel. Alana is on edge. She points a gun at Kaden when Kaden arrives at the door. She thinks Kaden is here to finish her off. Kaden tells her no. She is here to stop him. Stop Plutonian. After Kaden convinces Alana that she is an ally, Alana and her get to talking. Alana tells Kaden of her and Plutonian's romantic relationship. They first met on the night of a charity function that Alana was working at. A villain named Dargo attacked it. Alana, she played fire marshal and helped evacuate everyone from the room in the building, while Plutonian showed up and fought the villain and took him down. After everyone was safe outside and the villain was put away, Plutonian came to talk to Alana and told her, Nice work. You saved lives. I like that in a woman. Alana, flattered, said her name was Alana Patel. Plutonian replied, Well, Miss Patel, there was supposed to be dancing at this function. May I? Plutonian then picked her up and they levitated above the crowd on the street and they danced in the air. That was the beginning of their relationship, and the next day, Alana was kind of famous. Alana, though, even though she was famous, she still went to work. Her job was at a radio station, and one of her co-workers at the radio station was a man named Dan Hardigan. Dan is actually the Plutonian's alter ego, his civilian form. While Alana was falling in love with the Plutonian and going on various dates with him and being all flustered by him, she had no idea that Plutonian was really Dan Hardigan the entire time. All of this is very similar to the whole Clark Kent, Lois Lane romantic relationship going on in Superman comics and movies. Plutonian and Alana dated for a while, until one day Dan pulled Alana aside inside an empty office in their radio building and he asked her to marry him, and he revealed to her that he, Dan Hardigan, was actually the hero, the Plutonian. Plutonian was expecting Alana to be happy, but instead Alana was very upset. Alana, in an angry voice, 
Tell is Plutonian? What the hell? Are you kidding me? How long have you been hiding this? How long have you been laughing at me? Plutonian tells her, I, I've never, honey, trust me. Alana says, I don't trust you. How can I? You come in here every day and you play your little joke on everyone here? Alana then runs into the hallway at work. She then runs into one of the broadcasting rooms in the radio station. And she tells all of the other employees, Everybody listen to me! Dan Hardigan is really the Plutonian! All of Alana and Dan Hardigan's co-workers are in shock. And one of the radio newscasters, upon hearing the news, immediately jumps on the airways and says, Holy! We gotta get this out! Open the mic! We interrupt this broadcast for a special exclusive. Eyewitnesses have identified the Plutonian as Mr. Daniel Hardigan. Man, I would be so pissed if I was the Plutonian. And this was the reaction I got from my supposed girlfriend and she just spilled my secrets? <laughs> well, Plutonian reacts fast. He still wants to try and protect his secret identity. So he immediately flies up into the sky, bursting a hole in the radio station building. Now given the factors of gravity and atmospheric interference, a radio signal takes approximately one third of a second to reach a satellite in space. Well, in that one third of a second, Plutonian flies up into space and destroys the nearest satellite up there before the radio broadcast can get out to the world. Plutonian then returns to Earth to the radio station, to the room where everyone is. Plutonian is furious. His eyes are red with anger. He tells them, You idiots! One of the radio employees begins begging, saying, Don't, don't hurt us! Plutonian tells them, Me? How can I save you? Do you realize you now know the most dangerous secret on Earth? Stop to think about what lengths my enemies would go to in order to learn about my private life. They would torture you. They would flay your partners and rape your children with hot knives. One of the employees says, We won't. We'd never tell. Plutonian tells the man, Ever? You'll never breathe a word of this? Not to anyone ever? Not even in your sleep? Or when you're drunk or tired or lonely? And even if that's so, what about him? Or him? Or him? Do you trust them to never drag you into this ever? For as long as you live? Your lives are worthless now. They are over. Even I can't save you. Plutonian leaves with Alana and he tells her that he forgives her and that he loves her and he still wants to marry her. Alana says she doesn't think she loves him back. She doesn't even know him, really. That was the end of Alana's story to Caden. Alana tells Caden that Dan Hardigan was effectively dead at that moment. As are all of her office mates now, three suicides and one overdose right after the other. They couldn't handle the paranoia. At least they didn't live to see Sky City wiped off the map. Caden asks if Alana ever heard anything about Plutonian's parents. Alana says that he slipped once and mentioned growing up in Wyoming. That's something that the paradigm can maybe use. Caden tells Alana to come with her. She says that the paradigm can protect her. Alana refuses, she says. Why the hell would I bother to leave? You don't get it. The Plutonian has gone rogue. We're all going to die. Elsewhere, Cubit gives orders to Gilgamos and Bette Noir to follow up on the Wyoming lead on Plutonian's parents. We also see Cubit has built himself a whole bunch of robot androids to assist him on his work. These are not normal robot androids though. They are modeled after Plutonian's greatest villain named Modius. Modius was the only villain that ever truly scared Plutonian. Modius is the only one who may be able to stop him. Modius has been in hiding for a few years now, missing. Cubit doesn't have access to the real Modius to ask him questions, so instead he designed and built these robots that are supposed to look like and think like Modius. And for now, that might be the next best thing. Issue 3 
we see some of Plutonian's perversions and how messed up he is on display. Plutonian, back in the day, had an affair with Gilgamos's wife, Bet Noir, and Plutonian never got over that relationship between the two of them. So right now, he is forcing a man that kind of looks like him to have sex with a girl he put a wig on that kind of looks like Bat Noir. And he is watching them and instructing them. And as he is watching, Plutonian wants the girl pretending to be Bat to say a certain phrase. The woman is hesitant. The man she is with on top of her begs her quietly, for God's sake, do it! The girl eventually says the line. She says, please save me, please save me. Plutonian, as he's watching, sheds a single tear. Plutonian definitely has some issues he should work out. Anyway, over to Philadelphia. The twin brothers in the paradigm who share powers named Scylla and Carrie sneak into a demolished, abandoned prison. Underground, this demolished prison is actually the home to the secret headquarters of a superhero named Inferno, aka billionaire Martin Reber, who I assume was sort of like a Batman Bruce Wayne type of person in this world. Anyway, Inferno is now dead, however, courtesy of Plutonian putting his fist through Inferno's head. So now, a whole bunch of villains have discovered the whereabouts of the headquarters and have now taken it over. When Inferno died and the world found out it was Martin Reber, the villain known as the Fixer stole all of Martin Reber's holdings and found his secret base. We see the Fixer as well as many more of his accomplices, such as Encanta, a woman who uses magic. These villains are in the base and they're looking around trying to see if they can find any valuables or maybe some cool technology that they can use. They also discuss Plutonian going crazy. He seems to be killing heroes. They suspect maybe he's on their side now? You know, the bad guy side? The villains? Paradigm member Scylla sneaks closer inside the headquarters to spy on the villains and what they are up to and see if they have any info on Plutonian's weakness they can use. Meanwhile, Carrie is staying on the surface outside the base so they can relay their communications back to Cubit. Now, while the villains are all talking and wandering around the headquarters of Inferno, the Plutonian just casually shows up and makes himself some coffee and sits down. The villains are a little shocked and a little scared to see him. How the hell did Plutonian find them and just waltz right in here? Paradigm member Scylla is very scared and hiding as well as he sees this all happen. One of the villains slowly reaches for his pistol. Plutonian, that was holding a coffee cup in his hand, smashes it and flicks one of the pieces of the coffee cup at the villain who is reaching for his gun. And that villain's hand kind of explodes and gets decapitated. Plutonian then casually asks the rest of the villains, Anyone else? No? Because I imagine you're all dying to scratch that same itch. Don't look surprised that I'm here. What, just because I can ram through a mountain with my head it means I'm not smart? I knew it was just a matter of time before you all pulled together. Safety in numbers, right? The Fixer asks Plutonian, so what kind of world do we live in now? And the Plutonian answers, that's a very good question, David. You don't mind if I call you by your first name. I mean, I've known it all along. I know all of you, but it always seemed easier on the soul to think of you as the Fixer and her as Encanta. That way you were problems rather than people. Let me tell you the kind of world I live in, David. It is a world of miserable, bitter, ungrateful paramecium who lash out at you in a state of perpetual rage for not solving their problems fast enough. You do astonishing things for them a hundred times a day. You bring wonder to the lives of ordinary people, and in the end, you realize it's like doing a magic trick for a dog. So you build a home out of a volcano, and you hope that noise drowns them out. Cubit, 
listening to this conversation through Skilla's earpiece notes that this is new information they never knew before, that the Plutonian has some sort of volcano base. The Fixer, trying to please Plutonian, says, That isn't your destiny. You should be surrounded by those who truly appreciate your power and who can help you find fulfillment in its use. Plutonian asks if Fixer is proposing a partnership of sorts. He says Fixer and the others must earn his trust first before that can happen. Plutonian elaborates, he says, Your instincts were good. You came here hoping that Inferno, the great and mighty tactician, might have invented something that could kill me. Here, Plutonian gives them all these little devices with a button on them, and he claims the devices will kill him if they press it. It is a test. He tells them, I'm saying that if you're really sincere about wanting to start fresh with me, you'll throw those devices away and... Before Plutonian can even finish his sentence, all the villains begin immediately pressing the buttons vigorously. Plutonian tells them, Wow, I didn't even get to the end of the sentence and you all pressed it. I gave you a fair choice. Did you really think I would just hand you away to hurt me? Even if there were such a thing? It turns out the buttons all the villains were pressing actually triggered the self-destruct mechanism for Inferno's headquarters here. And the headquarters then explodes, with Plutonian standing right in the middle of the blast. Of course it doesn't affect him, but everyone else around him dies. Most notably, the Fixer died, as well as Paradigm member Scylla that was spying on the villains in Plutonian talking. Carrie, the brother of Scylla, did not die though, as he was outside the headquarters at the time. But he did get badly injured. More on him in a bit. When the dust clears, the only person left of the villains is the magic-based villain named Encanta. She was able to protect herself with some sort of force field shielding spell. Plutonian, he finds her and looks at her and says, I wonder, I wonder what you'd look like in a wig. Plutonian is thinking of using Encanta for some sort of bet noir cosplay in the future. Issue 4 Back at where the Paradigm are hiding out. They have retrieved Carrie from the site of the prison explosion last issue and brought him back to their secret headquarters and have him in some kind of healing chamber. Carrie's brother Scylla, of course, did not make it. Over at the United Nations, they are having a meeting to discuss what to do about Plutonian. The Americans suggest banding together to fight Plutonian, maybe with nuclear weapons? Some of the other countries, though, are less keen on this. The American delegate says, not one of you will speak up in defense of your own country? We are at war, worldwide war. The delegate from Kenya speaks up and says, We are at war with a vengeful god, Mr. Secretary, one who can hear the whispers of a conspiracy from anywhere on the planet. The people of Kenya choose to extend not a fist, but an open hand by inviting the Plutonian to the Kenyan throne as its new sovereign. Delegates from other nations start arguing. They too want to make Plutonian an offer. One of the other countries says, unacceptable. The People's Republic declares itself as the Plutonian's new homeland. The delegate from Japan says, under what right? Japan is willing to make whatever necessary economic concessions to welcome him to. And then another delegate butts in and says, no, Japan is already a superpower. The global imbalance will be way off. The American delegate chimes in again and says, Oh dear God, you cannot tell me that you're proposing anything less than global unity in the face of this crisis. You've seen what we're dealing with. This psychopath is no longer a hero to your children. He's a genocidal maniac. We don't know what he wants. We don't know why he turned. What is wrong with you people? How can you? Plutonian then shows up. 
he uses his freeze breath on the delegate from America. Plutonian then whistles in a high-pitched tone and causes the frozen American delegate, who is now in ice, to explode into many little tiny frozen pieces. Plutonian then tells the rest of the people in attendance, Actually, I kind of liked the way this debate was going. Continue! The various country representatives say they wish to offer Plutonian citizenship to their various countries. They will give him riches or anything he desires. Plutonian is interested. He points randomly to one of the other delegates and asks, You! You're from where? The delegate answers, uh, Singapore. Plutonian continues, Singapore. Tell me, Singapore. You want to be my home because... The delegate from Singapore, trying to think on the spot, trying to figure out what Plutonian wants to hear, says, Singapore should be your home because we uh, seek your strength and guidance in a hostile world. Uh, but we also recognize your long history of service to our nation. We embrace you because... Because, um... We are grateful to you. Plutonian is upset. He is listening to this man talk as well as listening to his heartbeat and he realizes that this man and these other people in the United Nations here, they do not want him because they love him or want his guidance. They only say these things because they fear him. In response, Plutonian decides to immediately destroy Singapore. He flies into space and he starts chucking ginormous chunks of diamonds. I don't really know where he got the diamonds from. Is that like a space thing? There's diamonds up there? Anyway, he is chucking ginormous chunks of diamonds down below on Singapore, and it is raining down across the country almost like a meteor shower. Cubit and his army of Modius robots and the rest of the Paradigm are watching in horror as the Scenes of devastation in Singapore start coming through. Cubit, Gilgamos, and Bet Noir teleport over with their quantum jumpers to begin trying to help injured people in Singapore. Plutonian, he is still on his path of destruction. Using his eye beams, he starts a tsunami off the coast. Cubit, who is now in Singapore, is trying to help people and he yells to Plutonian. He begs him, saying, Tony! I know you can hear me, don't do this. There are four million people on this island and they've done nothing to you. Tony, please, the diamonds, the earthquakes, I can see what you're planning to do. A crowd of people start forming around Cubit. The entirety of Singapore will soon be destroyed. Bent Noir and Gilgamos managed to save a few people but they eventually got knocked out by Plutonian and Quibbit puts the two of them through the Quantum Jumper portal back to safety at their base. And then Cubit starts ushering other Singaporeans through the Quantum Jumper portal as well. He is trying to save as many as he can. But Tony puts a stop to this. He steals the Quantum Jumper device right off Cubit's wrist. Cubit to Plutonian says, Tony, no! Give me the Quantum Jumper back! All of these people will die! Plutonian tells Cubit, choose 10. Cubit replies, Tony, 10? There are millions here. Plutonian just replies again, choose 10. Cubit, he randomly points to people in the crowd. He says, you and you and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, you, you. Cubit then tells Plutonian, there Tony, 10. Are you happy? 10 of millions. Plutonian says, that's what it feels like. He then uses his eye beams to begin incinerating many others in the crowd. Plutonian gives Cubit his quantum jumper back and tells him to go. Plutonian, he then flies into the air and then he smashes down on the ground and in combination with the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the diamonds he was chucking and everything, Plutonian manages to sink Singapore into the ocean. Other than the lucky 10 people that Cubit saved, the rest of Singapore all die and drown in the sea. Plutonian, he is flying above it all and he watches his work. Back at their headquarters, Bet Noir, Gilgamos are resting and healing, as is Carrie. Cubit turns to his Modius androids he built and he tells them, 
That's it, damn it. That's it. I've given you all the time we can afford. Answer the question you were built to answer. Modius, where are you? And with Cubit begging his Modius androids to find the real Modius, we end Volume 1. Alright, that was Volume 1 of Irredeemable, and what a fantastic opening volume this was. The action is dialed up to 10 immediately, right away, and it keeps it there basically the entire time. So many things in this book just stick with me. I read this series for the first time years ago, and I still remembered various scenes. So that scene at the baseball stadium really stuck with me. How he saved the day, and everyone is cheering him, but yet, you know, he's, he's an evil Superman. He can hear everybody, and there are a few people in the crowd that are being jerks, and he hears it, and it sticks with him. He just can't let it go. He puts it deep down inside. He tries not to let it bother him, but... It adds up over the years, and Plutonian eventually snaps because of the way society kind of views him. I love the opening scene in issue one where he kills the hero and his family in their home. That is so dark and evil. It really expresses, like, how will you stop this guy? I like the scene where he reveals his identity to Alana, his girlfriend, and her reaction to that where she basically tells the rest of their colleagues and the colleagues put the word out there on the radio station airways and then Plutonian just goes crazy and basically has to destroy a satellite and come down and oh man that whole scene is just insane and then the final issue in this opening volume where the United Nations are debating what to do and they kind of say we'll just make him our king and Plutonian he arrives and he listens to them and talks to them and he basically decides to sink Singapore in the end and destroy that country because he doesn't need them. And he's angry with them that they, that they fear him and they don't love him. Oh, so many great things explored in this book. This, it's a great exploration of the evil Superman concept and uh, immense fun. Uh, I'm going to give this opening volume a uh, 9 out of 10. Really good stuff. Really fun. Really want to explore more and see. How will they take this guy down? And also, I want to learn more about what caused him to snap in the past and learn more of his history. So there's some great mystery seeds planted in this first volume. Thank you all for watching. And I'll be back next week with volume two of Irredeemable.